got to speak one or two words and <clears throat> just to try my voice I understand I don't know well, two things that people always want to ask me well, one of them is how I ever came to write the Sherlock Holmes stories and the other is about how I came to have psychic experiences and to take so much interest in that question well first of all about the Sherlock Holmes stories. They came about in this way. I was quite a, a young doctor at the time. I'd had, of course, a scientific training. And uh, I used occasionally to read detective stories. It always annoyed me how in the old-fashioned detective story, the detective always seemed to get at his results, either by some sort of lucky chance or a fluke, or else it was quite unexplained how he got there. He got there, but he never gave an explanation how. Well, that didn't seem to me quite playing the game. It seemed to me that he's bound to give his reasons why he came to his conclusions. Well, when once I began to think about this, I began to think of turning scientific methods, as it were, onto the work of detection. And I used, as a student, uh, to have a old professor, his name was Bell, who was extraordinarily quick at deductive work. He would look at the patient, he would hardly allow the patient to open his mouth, but he would make his diagnosis of the disease, and also very often of the patient's nationality and occupation and other points, entirely by his part of observation. So naturally I thought to myself, well, if I scientific man like Bell was to come into the detective business, he wouldn't do these things by chance. He'd get the thing by building it up scientifically. So, having once conceived that line of thought, uh, you can well imagine that I had, as it were, a new idea of the detective and one which it interested me to work out. I thought of a hundred little dodges, as you may say, a hundred little touches by which he could build up his conclusions, and then I began to write stories on those lines. At first I think they attracted a little, very little attention, but after time, when I began the short adventures, one after the other, coming out month after month in the Strand magazine, uh, people began to recognize that it was different to the old detective, that there was something there uh, which was new. They began to uh, buy the magazine, and uh, it uh, prospered, and so I may say did I. We both came along together, and uh, from that time Sherlock Holmes fairly took root. I've written a good deal more about him than I ever intended to do, but my hand has been rather forced by kind friends who continually wanted to know more, and so it is that this monstrous growth <laughs> has come out out of what was really a comparatively small seed. But the curious thing is how many people there are in the world who are perfectly convinced that he is a living human being. I get letters addressed to him, and I get letters asking for his autograph, get letters addressed to his rather stupid friend, Watson. I've even had ladies writing to say that they'd be very glad to act as his housekeeper. One of them, when she heard that he had turned to the occupation of keeping bees, wrote saying that she was an expert at <coughs> segregating the queen, whatever that may mean, <laughs> and that she was evidently predestined <laughs> to be the housekeeper of Sherlock Holmes. 
if there's anything more I could say with advantage about him. But on the other point, which is to me, of course, a very much more serious one, on the question of my taking up this psychic matter, curiously enough, my first experiences in that direction were just about the time when uh, Sherlock Holmes was being built up in my mind. That would be about the year 1886 and 1887. So nobody can say that I formed my opinions on psychic matters uh, very hastily. It is just 41 years now since I wrote a signed article upon the subject, which appeared in a magazine called Light, so that I put myself on record. During these 41 years, I never lost any opportunity of reading, of studying, and of experimenting on this matter. People, I suppose, I've said with more mediums, good and bad and indifferent than perhaps any living being. Anyhow, a larger variety, because I've traveled so much all over the world, and wherever I've gone, either in Australia, America, or South Africa, uh, the best that there was to be had in that direction uh, was put at my disposal. Therefore, when people come along and contradict me, you have had no experience at all, read little and perhaps never been to a seance, uh, you can imagine that I don't take their opposition very seriously. When I talk on this subject, I'm not talking about what I believe. I'm not talking about what I think. I'm talking about what I know. There's an enormous difference, believe me, between believing a thing and knowing a thing. I'm talking about things that I've handled, that I've seen, that I've heard with my own ears. And I always mind you in the presence of witnesses. I never risk hallucination. I usually, in most of my experiments, have had six, eight, or ten witnesses, all of whom have seen and heard the same things that I have done. Gradually, I became more and more convinced on the matter as I studied year in, year out. But it was only in the time of the war when all these splendid young fellows were disappearing from our view. The whole world was saying, well, what's become of them? Where are they? What are they doing now? Have they dissipated into nothing? Or are they still the grand fellows that we used to know? It was only at that time that I realized the overpowering importance to the human race of knowing more about this matter. Then it was that I flung myself more earnestly into it and that I felt the highest purpose that I could possibly devote the remainder of my life to was trying to bring across to other people something of that knowledge and assurance which I had acquired myself. Certainly the results have justified me. I'm quite sure I could fill a room of my house with the letters that I have received from people uh, telling me of the consolation which my writings on this subject and my lectures on this subject uh, have given to them. How they have once more heard the sound of a vanished voice and felt the touch of the vanished hand. And that is the grandest work, I think, that a man could do. I've only been a humble instrument in the hands of Providence in spreading this truth, but it has taken such root uh, that now I know that it's only a question of time before the whole world <coughs> shares the same knowledge which I have myself. But don't <coughs> for one moment suppose that I'm taking it upon myself to say that I am the inventor of spiritualism or that I am even the principal exponent of it. There are many great mediums, many great psychical researchers, investigators of all sorts. All that I can do is to be a gramophone on the subject, to go about, to meet people face to face, to try and make them understand that this thing is not the foolish thing which is so often represented, but that it really is a great philosophy and, as I think, the basis of all religious improvement in the future of the human race. Ask me, will I write any more Sherlock Holmes stories? I, I certainly don't think it's at all probable. 
But as I grow older, the psychic uh, subject always grows in intensity and then one becomes more earnest upon it. And I should think that my few remaining years will probably be devoted much more in that direction than in the direction of literature. Nonetheless, of course, I haven't abandoned writing. One has to earn one's living. But my principal thoughts are that I should extend, if I can, uh, that knowledge which I have on psychic matters and spread it as far as I can to those who have been less fortunate. Well, <laughs> goodbye. I'm alive. Oh, right.